we were just talking about bobcats, and a bobcat is a representative of what we call a lesser cat. You can divide all of these cats into two basic groups. You have great cats and lesser cats. And the great cats are great cats mostly for one main reason. There are several differences between great cats and lesser cats, but the main difference is that a great cat can roar. And it's because it has a floating bone under its larynx called a hyoid bone. And this is what gives it the ability to roar. And the rest of the cats don't have this, so they are considered lesser cats. I'll tell you what, Hana, if you kind of pull down that way so that he's facing Jumanji. And this is, this cat's name is Jumanji. So he's the first great cat that we're meeting today. And there are four species of great cats, lions, tigers, leopards, and jaguars. That's it, the rest are considered lesser cats. He is a black leopard, so this is the first representative of a great cat we're meeting today. He's a melanistic leopard. So a black leopard is not a different species. He's not really what you'd call a black panther. That's probably the first thing that you thought when you saw him. But there's not a cat roaming around in the wild that is his size that is a solidly black color. They have spots. And, uh, uh, so uh, those spots go all the way down to his skin. So he's considered a melanistic leopard. And two golden leopards can produce a black leopard. It's just a color variation that happens. And the same thing happens with jaguars. So black leopards and ja black jaguars are really what we're talking about when we're talking about mm. black panthers. The leopards are the smallest of the great cats, topping out at about 150 pounds, but they can be as small as about 80 pounds, and some of our leopards are that small. But in spite of the fact that they are a little bit on the smaller side, in the wild they can kill an animal that weighs twice as much. He could kill an animal that weighs twice as much as he does. And oftentimes what they'll do is drag it up into a tree. And they'll just leave it there and come back and feed on it night after night. So this helps to keep other predators from coming and stealing it from them. You've probably seen pictures of leopards sleeping in trees. They love to hang out in trees. Their front paws rotate around a little bit more efficiently than some of the other types of cats. So they're good at negotiating those skinny branches when they get up in the trees. So that's what you would find him doing in the wild. And you would probably find him in a rainforest in Southeast Asia. The darker colored cats like this, the melanistic ones, you usually find in the rainforest because that camouflage is a, it's a good color for them. It's very dark in a rainforest. There's a lot of foliage and it's really dark. So you'll find your black jaguars in the rainforest in South America, but your leopards you find in Asia and Africa. You find them on the other side of the world. And leopards have the widest distribution of any exotic cat around the world. It doesn't mean to say they're not critically endangered in some parts of their range, but they have a wide distribution around the world from Africa to Southeast Asia. So that's probably where you would find him hanging out in the wild, preying mostly on uh, the, the hoof stock, your Impala, your reed bug, and things like that. Anything that's like a deer is what they like the best. But they'll prey on about 90 different species, so they have a flexible diet. He also came from the exotic pet trade. There was a time when our founder would go to auctions and she would buy cats just because she knew the fate that they were going to end up with if she didn't. She doesn't do that anymore because she realized that by paying for the cats, by putting money into this practice, that she was just supporting it. Mm -hmm. But he is an example of one that was purchased in that way and uh, was raised here. So he came from the exotic pet trade. So Believe it or not, you got lots of people who want to keep leopards as pets. Did you get him as a small cat? Yes, he was a cub when he came. No, we do not them? touch them. We are a no-contact facility. The only ones that touch them are the vets if they have to and maybe senior staff in some situations where it's absolutely necessary. But this is a no-contact facility. There's a lot of people out there who underestimate the power of these animals. And all it would take is for one of us to get some small injury and we might be required to put that cat down. So we would not jeopardize their lives in that way. And also, we feel that they are wild animals, and as a part of respecting their dignity as wild animals, even though they are living in captivity, we should respect those boundaries and treat them as the wild animals that they are. Now, that's not to say they don't get attention, trust me. They are, we, our keepers are uh, focused on making their lives better all the time. So we, what we do is a lot of what we call enrichment. So when you see balls and toys and pumpkins and uh, little hammocks that are made, we make the hand make these little hammocks and uh, little wooden platforms and stuff. That's all made to make their lives more comfortable. And of course, we're talking to them and engaging with them that way. We're doing just about everything outside of touching them that we can do to make their lives more comfortable here. Uh, but we are very careful about that, uh, again, to respect their dignity and because we want to really try and send the right message, which is that wild animals are not animals that are supposed to be petted.
If they were, then we could go up to one that's living in the wild and do that. But nobody would ever, hopefully, be dumb enough <laughs> to walk up to a black leopard or a lion or a tiger and try to pet it in the wild. And, uh, and I'll be talking to you a lot about these issues as we go along. They all eat uh, cows and chickens. We feed them beef quarters, chicken quarters. They have to have raw muscle meat, raw organ meat, and raw bone to meet their nutritional needs. And so that's what they get. The great cats are going to eat about 10 to 15 stories. You know, yeah, I mean, a lot of people will ask about the cats that have been pets. And they'll say, well, but if you never touch them, you know, are they sad about that? Um, it's impossible to say. I mean, obviously, we can't ask them. And uh, like I said, that's why we do everything outside of petting them that, that we can to make them feel comfortable. Um, but it, some of them that were pets, and, and if they were treated well, they do tend to seem a little more open to people coming around, which is one of the reasons that they're on the tour path, because we have some cats who were just downright abused, and they don't want to see anybody. And we don't make them see anybody except the keepers, and the keepers come around to clean their cages and things like that. Uh, so there, I think there is a little bit of truth to that. I mean, they're, they're mammals and they adjust just like we do. So it's not that they cannot adjust at all to people. It's just that they can't take away their own instincts. They can't take away their, their strength and their ability. And for a lot of folks who have worked with these animals, either in the entertainment industry or if they own them as pets, uh, the, the cat might be playing with them. And they may not survive an encounter like they're not built to play with a tiger or even a cougar. A cougar, take a look at Enya here, and she's on the small side for a cougar, but a cougar can hit an elk with the force of a small truck, and they do sometimes. They're very, very powerful animals. Again, they were built to kill. That is what their job, that's really all they do. They just kill. That's what they're supposed to do. Thousands of years of developing them has made them into killing machines. They were not meant to curl up in our beds with us or hang out in the basement or in the backyard or anything like that. So uh, it becomes a real problem for, for everyone involved. Now here we're looking at a, a cougar, as I said. We've got a, a lot of cougars around here. We have Mac over there and we have Enya right here. Cougars are known by a lot of different names. Mountain lion, catamount, mountain streamer, puma is a South American word for a cougar. A Florida panther is actually a subspecies of cougar. So it's all the same cat, they're just known by a lot of different names. Now, they have the widest distribution of any mammal in the Western Hemisphere besides people. And that's probably why there's so many different names. In the Pacific Northwest, where there's mountains, they call them mountain lions. Nobody would have thought to call them mountain lion in Florida because there's no mountains here. But Florida panther is a misnomer as well. That's a subspecies that used to roam all across the southeastern U.S. They were in a lot of different states in the Florida at one time in our history. But unfortunately, we have relegated them to one tiny corner of Florida and are rapidly developing them uh, as we speak. There's only about 100 Florida campers in there, so their, their future is pretty precarious. Like I said, uh, this is another um, black leopard, like the black leopard we met before, Jumanji. His name is Saber. Saber was somebody's pet at one time. You know, I really don't know. I really don't know. I, I think a lot of times what happens, and, and I talked to some people on my tours. I did have a, a young couple on one of my tours that wanted an exotic pet. They, in fact, they had got the cage. They were going to go and get a serval. We'll meet a serval in a minute. And I'll tell you, he grew up in Florida, and the woman that lived next door to him was keeping a cougar in her backyard. And when he was a little boy, he would stick his arm through the fence, and he would pet this cougar. So, of course, growing up like that, it never occurred to him that maybe keeping a wild animal and that even if it was safe for people, it's still not appropriate for the animal. Uh, and they were so nice and so uh, open-minded and willing to listen, and they got done with the tour, and they said, you know, we're not going to do this. We're not going to do this. So this is, we understand this is a bad idea. And so here's the serval. Really I was telling you, we'd meet a serval in a second. And this was the type of cat that these, uh, this young couple that came to Big Cat Rescue was thinking about getting. Um, can you see it good enough from where you are? Are you good? OK. Um, and so if you look here at this cat, you can see why somebody might think it would make a good pet. It's relatively small as far as exotic cats go, and it's very exotic with the exotic cat in the exotic pet trade. People want to do one of two things. They either want to own a serval or they want to cross it with a domestic to create something called a savanna cat. Savanna cats are very, very popular right now. And uh, they're very problematic. Some of the hybrids can be an even worse problem than the full-blooded uh, wildcats. You see the kind of attitude, and a lot of servals are like this. They're very hissy and uh, uh, 
crabby. The, um, we have a savanna cat here that we rescued, and uh, its name is Diablo, if that gives you any idea of what its attitude is. But a lot of them have some serious health problems, particularly digestive. So they'll be having explosive diarrhea all over people's houses. And okay. it's, a, it's a real nightmare. What the promise usually is, is that you're going to get a, a wild-looking cat with a domestic personality, and what you almost always get is the exact opposite. So uh, it's a real problem. Yeah. These three are siblings. Their mother was shot by a hunter in Idaho. Uh, some of the cats, I mean, they fight. Any cats living together are going to yeah. fight from time to time. Now, if they fight too much, then um, we will separate them. Mm -hmm. Almost never comes out. So I want you to get it. Like, what is that? that is the cutest it looks thing like a ever. Cat. <laughs> <laughs> Look at its big head. Oh, let's see. Oh, Maybe you can turn around yeah. them this way. Oh, oh my goodness. Yeah. I have a really hard time passing them. Yes. Uh, <laughs> like uh, are they commonly uh, kept? No, I, really they're not. Um, the, most people have never heard of a sand cat. There's not that much that's known about them. They're very difficult to study because they blend in with the sand. They live in the Middle East in the desert. They blend in with the sand. And so it makes them very, very difficult to study. Uh, yeah, she just said something interesting, and everybody always says that. that when, when they look at him, they say, well, I'd have a hard time passing that one up. Uh -huh. You should come on a feeding tour and see what he's like when the food is around. <laughs> He is still very, very much a wild animal. The thing about uh, cats like this, and, and it really brings up a, a good point, something that we need to consider. There's really two different things we need to consider when we're considering the ethics of keeping animals like this as pets. And one is, they're, they're obviously, safety. I mean, we can look over at Zabu and see why it would be stupid to want to keep a tiger as a pet. But with a sand cat, it's a little bit harder because they're so much smaller. But the thing is, we also have to look at the well-being of the animal. I can promise you, this sand cat is really cute, and we may think it's cuddly. I can promise you, Canyon does not want to cuddle with any of us. <laughs> mm -hmm. He doesn't. He's not going to curl up in your lap and be all cute and sweet like a domestic cat would because he still has a wild instinct. Even if you take a look at him right now, he's a very high-strung cat. Mm -hmm. He would not be, I mean, we think he's really cute, but trust me, he would not be a satisfying pet at all. Uh, but but sand cats really need to stay in the wild and, and do what they do in the wild, just like all these cats do. He came from the first Persian Gulf War, and I'm not sure what the exact circumstances were. There may have, I suppose, maybe there were some soldiers that felt sorry for them because there were other soldiers out there that were taking pot shots at the sand cats. They were using them as target practice. So there were about four or five of them that came back from that war and lived in California for a while and then came here. 
Uh, and they've, they've all since passed away, I think, except Canyon here. And then we have one more named Jeannie, but she's not on the tour path. Big cat is playing with the ball over here. Uh, yeah, let's come on over here and take a look at...